Because we all enjoy food, and there is little debate that it is one of the greatest delights in life, my view about what we ate in the past is a simple one. I think the food of the past was just as delicious as the food of the present. I don't believe people who have any choice in the matter bother to eat gunk. Because of poverty, the majority of people throughout our history were reduced to a very small range of subsistence foods. Because all they had to eat was bland and monotonous, they searched for ways to brighten it up into something greatly more appetising. They did that because that's what people are like now, and people do not change. Human beings in the past were basically ourselves, driven by the same needs, hopes and desires. Though born at a different time and given a different set of cultural influences, notions and beliefs, the palate, as a sensual receptor, had the same requirements as today, to be satisfied and stimulated. So I differ from many food historians who have written disparagingly about the food of the past, either considering it gross, such as roasting whole carcasses, which they ate till the fat ran down their chins and into their beards, which subscribes to a Hollywood view of the banquet as orgiastic pig's will, or, as I have mentioned previously, as rotting meats, which only a ton of spices could make palatable. There were hundreds of bylaws which were used to prosecute cooks and butchers if they were discovered attempting to sell rotting food. Such erroneous impressions also ignore the fact that large carcasses were valued as live creatures which were labouring hard in the fields. You did not slaughter them until they were too old to work, nor, as meat was so precious, did you cook them without great care and skill. Besides, the wide variety of recipes for sauces to have with different meats would delight any gastronome of whatever era and must surely impress us with the culinary expertise of the medieval cook. Throughout the period of the first part of this book, there were ceaseless struggles between the princes, the church and the nobility for their share and control in the produce of the land. In the course of the 12th and 13th centuries, a further group emerges – the privileged town dwellers, the traders who were to become the bourgeoisie. In England, they played a particularly influential role at an early date on our food and cooking. Food was to play a part as a visible celebration of power and affluence in the struggle between the various elites, and food was also the source, if not an integral part, of the wealth of the new bourgeoisie. When the sumptuary laws began and stopped tells us much about bourgeois affluence and pretension. For instance, refer to chapter 3 for information on the spices in the city of London in the 12th century under Henry II. These traders provide an important clue to how much the new Anglo-Norman nobility treasured the use of spices in their cooking, which meant how much they cared about the flavour and the recipes. Fashion is also a guide. In ages where male courtiers were concerned about the length of hems, shoes and hair, that same aesthetic selectiveness operated at the table. It is unimaginable that such an immaculate and perfumed society sat down to eat coarsely while the fat ran down their chins. <laughs>